Indian No More by Charlene Willing McManus with Tracy Sorrell. For all the Native nations and their citizens who suffered the terrible impact of termination and relocation. A note for readers. Indian No More focuses on an Umpqua family in the 1950s and includes both words and sayings in Chinook Wawa, the language of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, and a number of historical references. If you would like help with or want to know more about anything you encounter in this text, please check the list of Chinook Wawa words below or the glossary and pronunciation guide. Thank you for reading. Chapter One, The Walking Dead. Before being terminated, I was Indian. Now, I certainly don't mean I was killed off or anything. It was 1954. The government didn't do that anymore. Not exactly. They just filed away our tribal roll numbers, erased our reservation from the map. What were our tribal roll numbers? They were the numbers the tribe assigned to its citizens and used by the federal government to see who belonged to the tribe. So my number verified that I was Regina Petit, roll number 3669, daughter of John Petit, roll number 858, granddaughter of Maud Petit, roll number 25, and Sid Petit, roll number 18. And that was what made you, in, made you Indian to the U.S. government. Numbers. Even after all that counting, the government chose to terminate us. I don't really know all the reasons why, but my Cheech, my grandmother, said this much. Termination means we're the walking dead. Now I ask you, how can we be dead if we're still walking? Chapter 2 res life. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start at the beginning. I was born on the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation, just over 30 miles west from the state capital in Salem, Oregon. I had lived there all my life. I didn't know any way to live other than as an Umpqua Indian. My family was Umpqua. I was Umpqua. That was just how it was. Living on the res, I played outside with my younger sister, Pee Wee. Her given name was Teresa, but nobody except our school teacher ever called her that. We ate wild blackberries and plucked blue laxpurs without any adults watching. Ours was a small reservation compared to others in Oregon, but people didn't bother with the whites that lived around us. Our res owned a cramped trailer that housed our health and dental clinic a post office that was used that used to be someone's house, and then everything you need from canned beans to carpenter nail store on the corner of Highway 22 and the Grand Ronde Road. My elementary school was painted yellow, and we had an old cemetery down the road. Our ancestors were buried there, like Chop Tim Tim, my grandfather, as well as Daddy's five-year-old sister, Bertha, who had died from the flu epidemic in 1934. Down from the cemetery was the Petite family home. Our house, with chipped white paint and warped boards, was surrounded by acres of tall grasses, plots of fragrant mock orange and a forest filled with chirping squirrels and robins. We had three bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen, a mudroom, and a newly built bathroom with an indoor toilet. Getting a toilet inside was one of the happiest days of my life. When I was little, I dreaded stepping off the back porch to the outhouse before bed. It was too close to the woods. Daddy would have to coax me out. But Daddy, I'm scared. What about Sietku? I'd peered into the woods as Daddy grinned. Old Sasquatch won't bother you. 
First, he's shy. Second, he's over six feet tall and smells like a wet dog. And third, well, if he does bother you, you must have been misbehaving. I wasn't too sure about the shy part. Regardless, my trips to the outhouse at night were few and far between, and extremely brief. Daddy's cousin, cousin Harlan's house was just half a mile away from us. Cousin Harlan and Daddy were really close, like brothers close. They talked story all the time, especially about World War II. It was right after Pearl Harbor, Daddy began, when I conned Harlan into joining the Navy with me. We both needed to get off the res before we got into any more trouble with the law. He meant that the way they were going, Jill would be their next residence. According to Cousin Harlan, it was a rainy summer morning when the big bus came barreling down the road. It squealed to a stop, splattering mud everywhere, right in front of the Grand Ronde Community Center. Then, the Indian agent jumped off the bus and said, That man who comes on this bus will be guaranteed three meals a day, clothes on his back, a place to sleep, and a paycheck. All he has to do is get on this bus. And you got on the bus? asked Pee-wee. Well, yeah, Cousin Harlan said. Lots of young guys took from the res took advantage of that deal. John and I were no exception. Hey, we pounce on that bus like a rabbit jumping into a snare. After everyone came aboard, Daddy said, the bus blew off the res, zipped down Highway 22, and didn't stop until it was in front of an army recruiting station in Salem. But I told Harlan I didn't want to join the army. You get shot at there. So I convinced him to sign up for the Navy. They promised anyone who joined them would see the world. Yeah, but they forgot to tell us that the world was made up of three-fourths water, Cousin Harlan said. Then they both howled, holding their coffee mugs in the air. After the war, Daddy and Cousin Harlan still did everything together. They both got married and worked for the Long Bell Lumber Company and its mill up in Longview, Washington, on the Columbia River. Daddy sometimes stayed away from home for weeks on end, but he didn't mind. It was a job that paid money. He had a family to support. That was what he cared about. When Daddy's big frame stomped home on those rare weeks off, he'd brush out wood chips stuck in his buzz-cut black hair. Mama usually had a steaming pot of seasoned deer meat, potatoes, carrots, and onions and salted gravy stirred up on the old wood stove. She'd greet him in the kitchen. Dinner will be ready soon, she would say, as she checked the biscuits in the oven. Daddy would take a whiff of the stew and then grab Mama around the waist. You are the prettiest girl in the res, and I'm the handsomest guy. How about a smooch? She'd shove him off and threaten him with a wooden spoon with a smile. Johnny Petit, the girls are watching. Mama didn't care for showing affection in public. No, we're not, Pee-wee would say, giggling from the kitchen table and drawing pictures to decorate the walls. Mama wasn't an Indian, by the way. She was Portuguese from the Azores. But with dark brown eyes and hair, she didn't stand out. Everyone on the res called her the Portuguese woman. Not by her nickname, Kate, and definitely not by her real name, Catarina. If that bothered her, she didn't say so. And for a Portuguese woman, that was pretty hard to do. The best thing of all was that Cheech lived with us. Most Grand Ronde homes had three generations in one house. Each night, Cheech combed my long, dark hair, saying, Never cut it. It's a powerful part of your umqua identity. When we cut our hair, it shows everyone that we are mourning the death of someone close to us. That always made me think of Chup. He had lived with us, too, until his big heart attack. Since the res doctor only visited the clinic two times a week, Chup died on a day when the doctor wasn't in. He died before our tribe was terminated, so he was still Indian when he was buried. Chuck's funeral was over at St. Michael's Church, with a big giveaway afterward just up the road at the community center. 
Giveaways help family and others in the community in the community remember a person or a, an event. For Chops giveaway, smoked salmon, homemade breads, and every kind of berry pie, the berry pie covered long tables. Another table held homemade do doilies, tablecloths, and pencil ties as giveaways. Some elders and those close to Chup received gifts. Everyone in the community gathered at the center and shared a meal. The grown-ups vis visited us while kids ran around the hall. From the wake to the burial, there was a lot of singing. Our voices helped Chup get up to the next place, making sure he felt comfortable and stayed there. There in the hall, as daylight faded, an elder pounded on the table with his flat hand. Then he'd pound again and again. A rhythm sprang from the pounding, a drum beat. Three poundings, then a pause. Three poundings, then a pause. Soon, the other men in their dress slacks, shirts, and ties sat down at a long table and joined in. We kids stopped running around. Then the elder wailed. The other men joined in, repeating this and singing a song I'd never heard. I leaned over to Cheech. My curiosity peaked. What are they singing? I whispered. It's an honor song, sweetie, for your chup, Cheech said. How do they all know the song? They heard it many times before. It's been passed down from family to family. Daddy leaned over too. We used to sing this during the day, but now we do it at night. Why? I asked. The Indian agent told us to stop. Frightened the next door neighbors. He leaned even closer. Thought we might be on the war path. Then he winked. Daddy seemed to find everything funny. Later that night, we had a ceremony to burn Chup's clothes and other items not given away. It was a special time. Our family visited Chup every Sunday after Mass. His old, beat-up logging cap sat atop the cedar board above his grave. Most of the graves had cedar boards covering the plots, so family and friends could place items on them that the dead had enjoyed when alive. Cheech had placed some cattail dolls on Bertha's board. Strolling around the cemetery, I would check out all the neat stuff on graves, like the simmer silver thimbles on top of Aunt Ivy's or the metal carving tools on top of Uncle Joe's, but there was no taking or removing anything from the cemetery. Cheech and other elders taught us that anyone who disturbed and disrespected the spirits like that would put themselves at serious risk. I didn't doubt that for a minute. Things changed at home after Chuck died. Cheech had her long, silver-streaked hair cut short in a ceremony to mourn Chuck. Each chilly gray morning, as she twisted Pee-wee's and, and my straight dark hair into two lengthy braids, we missed hearing Chup's stories. After she finished, she would put on her well-loved yellow apron and make us hot, clumpy oatmeal with dried huckleberries and cups of coffee mixed with lots of canned carnation milk and sugar. Then Pee-wee and I would head outside to play or head over to the Indian Agency School. Daddy would hitch a ride with Cousin Harlan to the mill, while Mama whisked down the road for her waitress job at the Res Diner. And Cheech, well, she sewed, made pies, and did whatever else grandmothers did. If I got up early enough, I'd join Cheech on the porch to wawa lahayam gabit sa'an, or greet the day. We'd sit together, she with her coffee and me wrapped in my favorite wool blanket, waiting for the morning sun to reach Spirit Mountain. Remember, that mountain is sacred to our people, she would say. It is a good sign if you see Sahali Tai, so pay attention. I'd keep my eyes peeled, and sometimes, I'd see a great bald eagle soar beyond the pines, 
thankful to call Grand Ronde home just like me.